Hi everyone, welcome again to Author Story. I'm Alexander Lim, your host, and for this episode, I'm interviewing Kate Sukel, author of the book, The Art of Risk, The New Science of Courage, Caution, and Chance. And for those of you following along who are interested, you can go over now to the Amazon link in the description below the video and check out or get a copy of Kate's book. So Kate, welcome to Author Story. We're really privileged to have you as our guest. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. So Kate, uh, you know, uh, please tell us about your background and your book. What's your story as an author? Uh, well, my story as an author is that I probably shouldn't be one. There's, okay. there's no good reason why uh, I should have one, let alone two book deals. Um, I kind of fell into writing by accident. Okay. Um, when I was little, I, I always said that uh, I wanted to be a writer, and my dad said, well, that's nice, Katie, but, uh, you know, I really think you should go into computers. That's where the money is. Okay, okay. And so when I, I went to college, uh, you know, I started studying cognitive neuroscience, and it sort of actually uh, seeded quite nicely into uh, usability work. And so I was mm -hmm. doing that for quite a bit. Um, but then I moved to Europe and I, I started writing on the side and found how much I enjoyed it and built up a career from there. So cool. um, it's funny because my, my love of writing and, and sort of my training as a scientist uh, uh -huh. really nicely dovetailed in, into a really, to me, a fascinating career looking at how science is, is shaping our lives. Right. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about the science aspect because you mentioned that your dad told you to go into computers. Yes, but I noticed that you are you have degrees, uh, bachelor's and a master's in psychology. Um, yes, was that any big leap uh, from uh, you know computers to psychology? Well, I, I went to Carnegie Mellon University, where I will tell you, no matter what you do there, you're involved with computers. I think they oh, have okay. the best drama schools in the country. But if you go there for drama, I think they make you even take a programming class. Oh, okay, um, all right. So everything and, and everything that, that CMU's psychology department does um, really is, uh, you know, involved with, with a lot of the computer science work. Right. Um, so the aspects of things that I was interested in looking at, uh, attention, focus, these were all things that, that human factors engineers, people who are designing our computers, our remote controls, our appliances, our cars, they're also interested in. Um, how, what do we pay attention to? How does the brain filter information? How do we let somebody know that danger is coming mm. or that they got to get up and start pressing record for their, their TV show right, right now? Right. Um, so they, they all kind of fit together. Um, so the engineering psychology was, was really part of a um, human factors engineering degree. Um, and then I actually went on to the, the computer science school, School of Computing at Georgia Tech afterward for my master's degree. Um, I just never finished up there. Okay. Okay. Got that. Cool. So, uh, as as a writer, how much how, how much have you written? I mean, in addition to say you know academic works, uh, what 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 other things have you written? Have you written articles and uh, stuff like that? So I started. I you know I was living in Europe. Uh, I had just had a baby. I wasn't working, mm. um, and I needed something so I didn't go crazy to do. Okay. So I started writing essays, and there were a lot of essays about being a new mom, mm. a lot of essays mm. about living in Europe as an expat. Right. Um, a lot of essays actually about being a military spouse while um, my then husband was deployed to mm -hmm. Iraq. Um, and I started, you know, small publishing them, uh, Christian Science Monitor, Washington Post, um, you know, literary mama places like that. And then, you know, as I was writing more sort of travel stuff, you know, travel magazines beckoned. So I started National Geographic Traveler. Right. Uh, right. Magazines like, um, you know, Travel and Leisure and, and what have you. Um, so it just sort of started small and built up from there. Um, and so I, I've written from everybody from the Atlantic Monthly uh, to the Washington Post. I've written about my dog for the bark. Okay. Um, you know, okay. basically any place that I that I had a good idea, and I, I thought that I could sell a story. Um, you know, Islands Magazine. Yeah. So so really any place where I I thought I could I had a story to tell. Right, and, and I mean, I think I think it paid off. I mean, you've got, uh, I mean, right now you've got the art of risk, and uh, I think you just mentioned you're working on another book as well. So uh, that's a big mm -hmm. that's a big expansion right there. Yeah, um, my first book uh, called "This Is Your Brain on Sex" was about the neurobiology of love and sex, and that mm -hmm. actually spanned off some work uh, that I had done for New Scientist magazine, um, looking at the science of love. 
Um, it also happened to, you know, fit into my divorce uh, from my first husband. And, uh, you know, so it was a really interesting process to move from articles to books. Um, but it was something that, that started, you know, with an article and just something, you know, I, I just started following the the rabbit holes in, into this really sort of big, bigger, more in-depth work. Um, right. yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry, you want to say something else? No, no. I, I mean, right. I think a lot of things, you know, we feel like we have to have uh, the whole idea right now, that mm. everything has to be, and I, I'm actually thinking about a third book right now, and okay. you know, okay. I'm writing down little notes here and there, and it's not fully formed. I think sometimes what you need to understand, especially with the book length project, is that uh, even though you have to write the book proposal and make it seem like you have everything figured out right now before you right. even get started, um, you know, these things evolve as, as you write them, as you learn more, and as you do your research. Mm, cool. Okay, cool. So next, uh, the book. It's about the art of risk, uh, but would you mind, uh, please, t for the benefit of our listeners who aren't familiar with the book, can you just give us a short summary of what uh, the book's all about? Sure. Um, so the book is actually about risk-taking behavior and why some people seem to always be walking the edge and why some of us are, are more risk averse, you know, maybe mm -hmm. hiding in the closet with the curtains closed. Right. Um, you know, and it's interesting because when I, I'm a brain nerd, and as I said, I'm trained as a cognitive neuroscientist, mm -hmm. the way that I kind of approach existential human questions like love, like risk taking behavior, uh, like heroism, altruism, what have you, is I, I want to understand the brain perspective. Right. Um, because we're learning that. that basically what amounts to three pounds of silly putty in our, our skulls, I mean, this is the, the organ that's responsible for every thought, every feeling, um, every behavior. So right. what, what is it doing? What is it trying to, to help us do or not do? Mm. And so with risk-taking, um, and, and this is, I would say, a great example of what I said about books evolving. When I started it, I really thought I was going to be writing this book about superheroes. Okay. You know, a certain set of people who had these genetic and or environmental gifts that allowed them to, you know, risk it all time and time again and, and still come out ahead. Mm. And actually what I learned from both the science and the successful risk takers I talked to is risk taking really isn't a personality trait. And that's the way we talk about it in, in okay. pop culture. You know, he's a risk taker. She's a risk taker. Right. Uh, I'm risk averse. Um, but it's not a personality trait. It's actually a really simple cognitive process, and it's one that's involved in virtually every decision you make every single day. Mm. So the art of risk kind of unpacks the science of understanding risk um, and then compares and contrasts that laboratory science with the stories of real-world risk takers like Andy Frankenberger, who's a two-time World Series of Poker champion, mm -hmm. Steph Davis, who's a world-renowned uh, free solo climber and base jumper, uh, David Baskin, who is a, one of the world's leading uh, neurosurgeons. Right. Um, I also spoke to a firefighter, an Army Special Forces operator, uh, right. a teenager, because of course teens are often the uh, ultimate risk takers, um, right. and really sort of tried to have a system of checks and balances, both for the success stories and for the science. Mm, okay, cool. I got that. Okay, so before we get into... Uh into the part about risk itself. Um, with regards to the book, you mentioned that you started writing this book out of something like uh, for about superheroes, but then it became what it is now. Right. But was there any single incident during the writing process that made you shift from writing about superheroes to writing about risk? You know, I think it's it started with um, I was probably on my third or fourth interview. As I said, I, I spoke to all these real world risk takers, mm. and these are people who you know jump out of planes, who uh, you know do plan you know hostage extraction missions or right. do surgery on people's brains. Right. And every single one of them, you know, they sort of said when I asked them about risk taking, oh, I don't really consider myself a risk taker. And you're like, uh, hi, you climb to the top of cliffs and you jump off with nothing but a wingsuit. Right. Or, you know, hey, you just pulled off the top of somebody's skull and started monkeying around in there right. with a scalpel. <laughs> and, you know, then they kind of look at you and say, oh, well, okay. You know, I, I, I just say that, you know, I don't take unnecessary risks. Mm -hmm. 
And that's what really kind of changed it for me because here I had all these people from very, very different domains right. who were telling me that they dealt with risk and uncertainty in very similar ways. Uh-huh. And that was really inspiring because that means that this isn't the stuff of superheroes. Mm -hmm. This is something that all of us could harness to our advantage. If we have a better understanding of how the brain wants to try to deal with uncertainty, how it deals with risk, why we have such, you know, um, initial gut reactions to certain activities, um, then we can sort of work around them in, in, in a more rational fashion. And it means it's not the stuff of superheroes. It's, it's the stuff of everyday people. So that was pretty exciting. Mm, okay, interesting, interesting. Now, you mentioned that risk is a cognitive thing rather than like an, 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 an something that's inherent to one's personality. What, what exactly do you mean by what do you exactly do you mean by that? Because I mean, most people they they associate risk with being, oh, he's really like that, or she's really like that, and it's right. really an inherent part of the personality. Well, we talk about risk in extremes. So it's either the stuff that is going to kill you, bankrupt you, uh, chase away your family, so you die alone and afraid, or it's the stuff that's gonna get you, you know, all your dreams, the money, the prestige, the girl, you know, all the things you want in life. Right. And really, risk isn't good or bad. Um, what it is, is it's necessary. Let's mm -hmm. think about even the simplest decision that you may make today. Okay. Um, okay. And for me, you know, I've already had two cups of tea. When I'm done with this interview, it's going to be whether or not I go down and get a third cup of tea. Okay. And I drink highly caffeinated tea. And I know if I have that third one... It's going to taste good, but around 2 o'clock, I might start to, you know, feel those after-caffeine effects. Right. Do I risk it? Do I don't risk it? And it sounds so silly, and yet even something that simple, whether or not to have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, hmm. whether what you eat for breakfast, um, whether or not to schedule a meeting at 10 a.m. versus 1 p.m., uh, you know, these things have a certain amount of uncertainty involved in them, and that's okay. really what risk is. It's not these big tales of daring do. It's any decision that has a potential, you know, unknown outcome where that unknown outcome could be negative. Right. So the other side of that coin, though, is that it could be positive. Um, but it really does come down to every single decision you make every single day has an element of risk involved. And once you get more accustomed to dealing with it in your coffee and tea drinking kind of decisions, um, you know, you find that it's it's actually not that hard to deal with in, in those bigger business and or sort of life-changing crossroads types mm -hmm. of decisions as well. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Cool. But I mean, l let's, I mean, like you mentioned, like, uh, you know, uh, special force operators, brain surgeon. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, <laughs> the things they do are a lot more complicated and potentially a lot more I don't know, they've got greater impact uh, compared to just going down and uh, deciding yeah, whether yeah. or not to drink another cup of tea. What, yes. wh what is it about them, the way they view risk, that differentiates, yeah, the way they view risk compared to ordinary folks like you and me? The difference is, is just how experienced, prepared, and educated they are in their particular domain. Hmm. So that Army Special Forces operator, and actually the surgeon as well, they have years upon years of training. And it's okay. the kind of training that they do where everything goes wrong, where okay. they really have to work at the edge of their performance ability, uh, where they have some scaffolding in place to help them you know, bump up against when they do make mistakes. Right. They have thorough after-action reviews when things go wrong to figure out how to avoid those problems next time. Hmm. And it's funny... You know, they're so well versed in their particular domain. What happens is the variables that we start to freak out about, they don't. Okay. Um, and in fact, the Army Special Forces operator, when he talked about jumping out of a plane, you know, he said most people think that this is so scary, but let's really break it down. You know, if I, uh, you know, have been trained in this, which I have been, mm -hmm. you know, I'm pretty safe. If I'm working with, you know, an airborne ops kind of crew who's also trained in this kind of stuff, I'm crazy safe. If I have a jump master, if I refresh my training, you know, what you have is residual risk and it's very, very small. Hmm. So while a lot of us might be freaking out about, oh gosh, wait, am I going to remember to check my, you know, my gauge to make sure when I need to pull my right. parachute or am I going to be able to reach back and get my ripcord in time? He's not right. worrying about little stuff like that. 
he's got that down cold. It's automatic for him at this point. What he's going to be worrying about is making sure he gets to the drop zone, that he, you know, is one step ahead um, to complete his mission. So what it does is it really changes the frame of the problem when you have that kind of experience. Mm. And it's funny because when you look at areas that you're not familiar, you'll even see these guys that are, that are you know, they look like superheroes start to freak out. There was a firefighter that I interviewed for the book, and he actually didn't make the book. Um, okay. It was too bad because he had some very colorful, colorful stories. But he was fascinating to me because he was telling me all about these crazy EMT calls where, you know, he's having to, like, you know, tackle a guy who's high on drugs and wearing nothing but a shower curtain. Ouch, okay. Um, but then, for some reason, we started talking about taxes. Okay. And I told him that I was using TurboTax, and he started to freak out. All of a sudden, this macho dude with this deep voice, you know, his voice goes all shrill. He's like, why aren't you getting an accountant? You know, all of a sudden he started talking about getting audited. One of his biggest fears was getting audited. And here you have this guy who has no problem about rushing into a burning building. Right. But the idea of an IR the IRS sending him a letter saying that he had gotten his taxes wrong was the scariest thing ever. So you quickly learn that risk kind of is in the eye of the beholder. Right. And, you know, it really comes down to this preparation and homework that makes something, um, it, you know, makes it able for you to, to really break it down and, and, and make risk work for you. Mm. Okay, well, th that's an interesting insight. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, preparation, practice, and different domains, that's, uh, that's definitely something. <laughs> well, it's funny how much familiarity plays a role, you yeah. know, depending on where you, you grow up. You know, I, I live in Texas now, but I grew up near New York City. So even as, you know, a pr like a preteen, I was riding the subway by myself. And right. of course, nobody thinks anything of that. Right. And I tell people here in Texas that, and they are horrified. Okay. They pretty much think, you know, getting on the subway in Manhattan is, you know, pretty much an invitation to be mugged. Right, right. But take that same hardcore Manhattan person, and I have these friends, put them in a rental car in the middle of, like, Wisconsin or Minnesota. Right. And then they freak out. They totally freak. You know, they're like, I can't figure out. They gave me directions. They said they go about three or four miles and then turn left at the chicken. Who turns left at a chicken? You know? Okay. I, I, okay. So it's all about familiarity. So then they start getting sort of freaked out about these big open roads and highways and trying to figure out how to get where they're going. Right. Uh, and then you have, you know, the people from the country who come to the city and think the subway is the place where, where it's all going to go. Uh, you know, south. So I, th I, I think it's interesting how something just as simple as that, assessing risk of, of transportation changes so much just based on where you're from and what you're familiar with. Right, right. Okay, cool. Well, that's uh, <laughs> definitely, yeah, that's a good point right there. <laughs> okay, so I'm not, Kate, I'm not sure if you did any, did you do any research on like the biological aspect of risk? I mean, where it might come from biologically? Did you do any sure. research on that? Okay. What, what, what's, is uh, our genes or our gender in any way related to the amount of risk uh, we tend to take as people? So the answer to that is both yes and no. Um, okay. There have actually been several studies looking at the genetic underpinnings of risk-taking behavior. Okay. Um, and if we look at sort of negative risk-taking behaviors like uh, violence, incarceration, drug addiction, um, one of the biggest predictors of whether or not uh, you will fall prey to those activities is actually having a Y chromosome. So okay. men, you are the leading risk takers. Uh, if you want to go to jail, you want to die of a drug overdose, you want to get in a fist fight, men, you take the lead. Okay. Um, but when we look at other genes, what we're finding um, is that there are some that seem to be involved with more impulsive behavior. Uh -huh. And that's sort of more fly by the seat of your pants, uh, you know, not assessing risk thoughtfully kind of behavior right. and uh, one in particular that's of interest is called DRD4 it's a gene for a dopamine receptor in the brain dopamine is a neurochemical that's often called the pleasure chemical but what it really is is a learning chemical it's it's released quite a bit when you receive a reward and it's basically there to help you learn how to go after uh, food sex uh, you know the most pleasurable things in life right. um, and of course, a lot of the things that we need to survive. Okay. Um, so
so DRD4 is interesting because it has been looked at and, and what they've seen is when you have a certain variant of this gene, mm -hmm. you're much more likely to take risks uh, when it comes to sexual promiscuity. You're more likely mm -hmm. to be sexually promiscuous. You're more likely to make bigger bets on a gambling task. Okay. You're more likely to actually make bigger bets in that uh, nursing home favorite bridge. Okay. Um, bigger bids, I guess they call Um And when you tie it back and talk to cultural anthropologists, what they'll tell you is this is a gene that probably, you know, got people out of their comfort zone and moving. Um, in order to propagate the species, people would have to go out into the world and sort of, you know, plow ahead to find new areas that might have more food, mm -hmm. more uh, abundance of, of, you know, potential mates, um, what have you. And so this pushed them to explore and, and to travel and to gamble. Um, so I, I think that there's, there's a lot of interest in that. But mm. I think the most fascinating thing about the genetic research is that, you know, we talk about genes as if they're the behavior. This is the risk gene or this is the warrior gene right. or this is the height, you know, right. whatever gene. But right. genes don't really work for, like that. You know, every single gene, what it does is it codes for a simple little protein. And how much and when that protein is, is created by the body really changes how your brain works. Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about any one of these genes, I think the important thing to understand is that its contribution to something as complex as behavior is, is going to be small. Um, and it's probably going to be hundreds of different genes that are going to shape whether you're somebody who's going to end up a firefighter or somebody who's going to end up, you know, uh, hiding in the cubicle somewhere. Right. Um, but even though all of each of these genes has a small contribution, each one of these little small changes over time can result in very different lives lived. And I think mm -hmm. that's what's fascinating. And so where the genetic research really is going, and a lot of the studies that look at these individual genes are, are fascinating, is how do we understand the contribution? How do we sort of, you know, what's the formula for, for certain behaviors, for, for certain kind of lifestyles? Right. Uh, and, and can we actually kind of distill, distill that formula down? So that's where things are kind of going, and I, I think it's pretty fascinating. Cool. Fantastic. Very interesting. All right. So that's the biological aspect. All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Kate, you know, I, I'm sure you interviewed a lot of a lot of people uh, for for the book. For you, who was the most fascinating person you interviewed? Well, um, you know, actually, they were all fascinating. It's hard to pick a favorite. Okay. Um, I think Steph Davis was was brilliant, just because you know she is this. Uh, free solo climber, and then a base jumper. Okay. And in fact, about a year ago, Cliff Bar canceled her sponsorship, saying that, um, you know, the things she does are too risky. Okay. And uh, she was actually the only woman in a group of about eight that they canceled, saying that, you know, her uh, her, her kind of deeds were, were too out of, far out, out of field for them, okay. um, which I thought was interesting. Um, and you... You think, you know, you hear about somebody like that, you meet her, you think that she's a certain, per, you know, boisterous, really extroverted personality type. She's a really thoughtful, uh, you know, okay. I mean, not, not that she's not, you know, doesn't do these amazing things, but she's kind of a homebody. Okay. She's this very thoughtful, considerate person. She's so smart. She She's really, you know, dedicated to her training and to what she does. Um, she's... She's probably not what most people would expect, and uh, you know, I, I was I was glad to meet her and have some of those stereotypes challenged. Okay. Um, I think the other thing that was fascinating to me about her was that a lot of times I think, especially with extreme sports people, what we say is they don't understand the consequences. They don't realize what the outcomes could be. Right. Uh, but with stuff, her husband died base jumping. Um, mm. So you know, not only does she know what the outcomes are, they're very personal to her. And yet she continues to jump because this is something that, that she loves. Um, so I thought that that was really interesting as well. This isn't a matter of, you know, not knowing the outcomes or wanting to ignore the outcomes. This is successful risk takers. They, they understand them very deeply, very implicitly. And um, even I think that what in, in, to a certain extent that actually allows them to do what they do because they can work towards avoiding those negative outcomes. Right, right, okay, yeah, that's, uh, 
Yeah, okay, so definitely I mean I, I, I thought all risk takers like extroverts, so that's an interesting that's a that's an interesting insight there. <laughs> okay, so Kate, let's say you met up with someone who is uh, fearful about doing something that seems risky to them. You know, okay. like, it could be like that firefighter is afraid of accounting or, you know, um, <laughs> even even me trying to do brain surgery. OK, but, you know, you had only enough time to tell that person one thing about how to handle risk or risk taking. What is that one thing that you would tell that person? I tell them to take a step back and ask them to imagine what the worst outcome could be. And then ask themselves if the cost of that outcome would really be too great to bear. Hmm. Because I think especially for most of us, even it, and, and the research shows this, as we get older, we become more risk averse. Right. And even the scientists I talked to said, you know, if people would, would just be willing to push it a little bit more, they'd find a lot more of the things that they want in life. Whether it be love, money, success, you know, just intellectual engagement, social connections, what have you. Um, you know, if they were willing to say what the heck a little bit more often. And so that's really what I'm trying to do now. Um, when my gut, sort of my initial reaction, automatic reaction is to say no to something, I ask myself, why? Would the cost, if I did this, really be too great to bear? And most of the time the answer is no. You know, maybe uh, I lose a night of my life or I find out that I'm really terrible at the tango or my husband is. Or, I, you know, I see a movie that uh, you know what wasn't my cup of tea but I gave it a try right. I've gotten a boost of, of novelty which you know the brain loves it soaks it up I've gotten out of the house I've connected with other people I've gotten all these benefits and those costs really you know compared to the benefits mm -hmm. um, you know I, I, I come out ahead even if the movie was terrible mm. okay all right cool got that definitely cool so Kate, you know, authors who write nonfiction books, you know, they sometimes go on a journey as they do so. You know, like they thought one way about one thing before they wrote the book, and then they thought another way about something uh, after they wrote the book. Something like that. Has working on this book done, the, done anything like that for you? Yeah. Uh, I mean, as I said, you know, when I started this book, I really thought that I was going to be writing about superheroes, what made this special group of risk takers different. And that's not what happened. I found mm -hmm. out that risk really was something that each and every one of us deals with and therefore each and every one of us can use to reach our long term goals. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing is it really has sort of changed me because, as I said, you know, you asked what I would tell that person who, who's afraid. I'm yeah. telling myself that. I want to do, you know, more in order to have a happier, healthier, and more fulfilling life. Right. So I want to go out there and, and, you know, instead of spending my weekends watching SVU marathons and, uh, you know, heating up the same thing for dinner, right. I want to try new things. I want to expand my horizons. I want to embrace more risk in my life so I can reap all of the benefits of it. Um, and that was, you know, another huge takeaway is just how healthy it is for you to seek out some of this novelty and uncertainty in life, how it, it does, you know, help keep you sharp. It helps build your skills. It helps keep you more connected. Um, there really is uh, very little downside if you approach risk in a more smart, thoughtful manner. All right. Very interesting. Cool. So, Kate, in the last few minutes of, uh, of this interview, can you just tell us a little bit about your current promo campaign for the book? Sure. So National Geographic Books, um, my publisher and I, have paired up for a campaign called Hashtag Summer of Risk. Okay. Um, and basically over the last few months I've been traveling around and I've been, you know, doing different science festivals and bookstores and what have you. And the thing that really surprised me is people came up to me and said, after I read your book, you know, I was inspired. I wanted to try this risk. Um, and it's ranged from, you know, finally taking a shot at an M MFA program to finally booking a trip to asking to lead a project at work. Um, one woman came up, she said, you know, you, you've given me the inspiration to start knitting with the expensive yarn. And I know these sound silly, but really is it's these small risks that build up um, not only into big benefits, but over time, you know, happier, more fulfilled lives. So summer of risk campaign is just uh, to... Think of the smart season risk that you want to take this summer. Throw up a selfie of you getting ready to do that because, of okay. course, accountability is important. 
tag it, uh, hashtag summer of risk, tag it with your location. And um, what we're going to do is, is share them. So our favorites will go up on the National Geographic uh, Books Facebook page. Okay. And then five lucky winners uh, will receive a National Geographic uh, Summer Reads book prize pack. So, yeah, I'd love to see what you guys are doing, what smart uh, season risks you're going to take. So between now and um, July 18th, throw okay. up a selfie, tag it, hashtag Summer of Risk, and let us know how you're going to take smart season risks to make your life better this summer. All right, cool, fantastic. So uh, they're right there, listeners. Uh, try it out. Uh, you've got the Summer of Risk right here. <laughs> well, I can't wait to see yours, Alex. Ah. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> It'll probably be uh, going for a cup of coffee rather than a cup of tea, but okay. <laughs> well, even that, you know, you can go for the, uh, you know, the large macchiato. Try a different kind of coffee. Right, right. <laughs> okay, then. So, in closing, the book is The Art of Risk, The New Science of Courage, Caution, and Chance. The authors are guest, Kate Sukel. And you can check out her book at her website at katesukel.com. That's k-a-y-t-s-u-k-e-l dot com so kate thank you very much for your time thank you very much for being an author story it's a real privilege to have you with us as our guest oh thank you so much for having me it was a lot of fun you're welcome and of course for those of you listening if you want to own the art of risk you can get it right now by going to the amazon link in the description below the video and if you'd like to follow our author interviews on youtube just click on the subscri subscribe button so bye for now everyone and I'll be back for our weekly author interviews and author story with another inspiring author.